Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. I read a tweet on the internet a couple weeks ago, and it got me thinking about some misconceptions about device management, specifically mobile device management, but really device management in general. And I think there are a lot of misconceptions. As we start to move into the more modern world where we are working on personal devices, work devices, and you and I, Adam, we've talked about kind of shifting that mentality from personal or work to a compliant device versus, you know, it doesn't really matter who owns the device. It's really whether or not it's compliant to have work data on it. And so it's becoming more and more accepted or just more deployed in enterprises to have device management it's becoming a requirement in order to have compliant devices to access company data. And I think there are a lot of misconceptions about device management. This tweet was, and I'm not really going to get into it, but he does security and privacy for Google. And so that's the first thing that I kind of wanted to be like, okay, well, this guy does it for Google. I mean, he probably has Gmail and he probably has uses Google search. And so there's already a lot of privacy that you're kind of giving up when you do that. But the, his tweet was, do not, I repeat, do not allow an employer access to your personal phone. So my question is, when I read that, and of course there was a bunch of people who replied and said, I'm never going to give access to my personal phone, blah, blah, blah. My question is, are we talking about physical access? Like you're handing over your phone to your employer? Or are you allowing them to manage your phone? Because it's two different things. And we can talk about either one, right? Because there are in some senses where I've known employers to confiscate a phone based on, say, a litigation where they literally need the phone if you've conducted criminal activity or something like that and you get arrested and they take your phone and then they scan it for all sorts of stuff. And so that's that's one thing. But managing a device through mobile device management, that's something completely different. And should you allow your employer to access and manage your phone? For me, I generally allow my employer to do that. I have phones that are managed by Microsoft. I have a computer that is a personal computer that I've enrolled in management. I have a Mac that is personal that I've enrolled in management as well. For the Windows and Mac machines, I accept that my employer is pushing down not only security configurations, but security tools. So on the Mac, they installed Windows Defender, ATP, now known as Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. Same thing for my Windows computer that is enrolled in Microsoft Defender for Endpoint right away. My phone was a little bit of a different story. I understand the technical aspects of how Defender for Endpoint work on a phone and how the DNS is routed internally to the address 127.0.0.1, but I didn't want Defender for Endpoint as an AV solution on my phone, and so I have a separate work phone. And honestly, for me, that has been kind of a nice mental break from work. I can turn off my work phone, put it down, and I go, don't get any notifications from work after a certain period of time. If I go on vacation, I leave my work phone at home. And so it's it's been a nice break that I can kind of separate it. I don't need to worry about literally having to uninstall an app or anything like that. I just leave the phone at home. And so that for me has been how I do that. But for most part, I do allow management on my devices. 
So there's a lot to unpack here, as usual. But should you allow employer access to your personal device, physical access? No, not without some sort of legal, you know, justification for it at the least. So, I mean, I agree with that completely from an MDM perspective. I think, you know, we're going to kind of go through this as we go along. I would say I generally always have allowed it. And for the most part, that's because I've worked for organizations that have been very ethical have made very clear that their interest in that is only as far as they need to validate the the security and health of the device. And they absolutely do not want to collect or see or invade personal privacy in any way. They've all been highly respectable, ethical organizations. I hear stories of companies that are not. And if I was less trusting of them, then I might have a different perspective. And it's not so much from from some of the things we're going to get into, like, can they see what I'm doing? And just more from the fact of they may abuse some of the controls they do have, like maybe they'd wipe my device when I left or something like that. And I think we'll kind of unpack those as we go along. But generally, I think first and foremost, there there are limitations to what they can do. And we're going to go through those in today's discussion. But for the most part, you still want to do that with an organization that is at least, you know, neutral at best or at worst, I should say neutral at worst in that they're just not a malicious um, organization or organization that just like loves to spy on people or is untrusting of their people or anything else. Like there are still concerns I would have with companies abusing whatever amount of access they have, which again is less than you think um, to, to, to do things they shouldn't. So let's, let's kind of move on and we'll get into more of what I'm talking about here. Cause I, I feel like I'm, I'm holding myself back, but, uh, this will be a good discussion today. As I read through the comments, one of the things that I think is the biggest concern is access to personal data and by personal data, most people associate that with their photos, their pictures, their texts, their other messaging apps, their personal emails. So can MDM solutions, when managed, access your personal data on those devices? For Windows and Mac OS, there is obviously if they're installing some sort of AV solution. So I'm going to caveat all this with just there's the difference between the device management and compliance and configuration versus some of the tools and apps that an organization may deploy as part of that device management. Okay, so there's two different things here. Mm -hmm. So let's keep the discussion for this particular portion of it just focused on device management. Because obviously, if we're pushing out AV products, and I kind of caveated that in the beginning where I, I drew a line at the AV part of it, any type of antivirus or malware solution, you know, they're going to scan files. They're, they're going to scan traffic. And so that's part of that device health attestation is that they're doing some sort of threat mitigation through an app there. But that app has to get on through the device management. The device management itself, let's say we're not deploying, and I've been in organizations that do both. Some will deploy a, some sort of AV app, some don't. And so if you're not deploying an AV app, does the device management solution have a way to see your personal data? And the answer is no. So that's a misconception. Right, people think, oh, I'm going to enroll in whatever device management solution you have, Intune, AirWatch, Mass360, whatever it is, it does not have the ability to see any of your personal data. So let's get that out of the way first and foremost. Yeah, so the way MDM, and again, I always kind of point this out just because as a student of computing history, this is fascinating to me. As much as Apple has kind of been 
seen as not an enterprise company, and, and certainly they still have some growth opportunities there. The modern MDM experience in almost all of the major platforms today has really been copied after how Apple did it all the way back in iOS 4 almost uh, 10 years ago now, in that you have an operating system that exposes certain APIs, certain commands to a management server, and then can either accept those commands and run them or can return results based upon them. And what that does is it ensures you're not running some sort of management agent on the operating system. The operating system maintains uh, purity in that it's only code from Apple or only code from Google or only code from Microsoft. And it is just responding to what the management system wants it to do. Oh, you want me to um, give you an app inventory. Sure. Here's an app inventory. Oh, you want me to um, validate that I have a pin cone set? I do. It's six characters. And that is how it works today. And, and so there isn't like a, a MDM command that's read me the content of this file. You know, show me this text message. Give me browser history. Those literally don't exist because the operating system vendors have not built those into the platform. So there's nothing like to your point, Andy, and I always, I always kind of make this well known as well because people don't always understand this. Because Apple and Google and Microsoft implement what you can call from the operating system perspective, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're, again, Intune, MOS 360, Mobile Iron, uh, AirWatch, whomever, you're going to get the same results because Apple dictates what those results are. And, and I appreciate that you are separating out the conversation from an MDM versus other solutions like antivirus, like EDR, like data loss prevention. Those can and do, to your point, scan a lot of behavior on your device. If you've ever seen the output of an EDR solution, which is kind of like that antivirus plus plus solution, it captures every activity, every everything on your endpoint. Oh, Adam renamed a file. Adam opened a file. Adam saved a file. Adam uploaded a file to this IP address. Like that's all there. And so my personally owned Mac that is enrolled with Microsoft Intune through Microsoft. Can Microsoft Intune read any of my personal stuff, like my iMessages or whatever? No. Can Microsoft Defender for Endpoint see that I'm transmitting messages back and forth to like Apple's iMessage environment? Yes. Can it decrypt and show all the contents of those iMessages? No. So there is some nuance here, but for the most part, to your point, especially when we really clarify, we're talking about the management platform. It does not have the ability to do that because the OS vendors have not made that accessible. The next thing that most people are worried about, and you'll get this when you have to install the device management profile or the certificate, right, is can an MDM solution wipe your phone? So let's separate out that there are different operating systems. And as Adam put it, there are different APIs that are exposed by those different manufacturers, Android and Apple or Google and Apple, I should say, Android and iOS, function differently. They have many of the same similar features in APIs, but at the same time, some of them are different. And so by design, you're going to have different behavior on the different operating systems. Same thing with Windows, same thing with Mac OS. Now, for Mac OS and for iOS... Apple does expose the API to wipe your device under management. So if you enroll, even if it's self-enrolled, they do have the ability to, at least for, now again, the vendor of your device management company has to implement that API too. Apple exposes the API and then that whatever device management that you're going with, AirWatch, Intune, whatever it is, has to take that API and then implement it into their solution. So maybe your vendor may not have that particular API implemented. Now, Intune does. Intune has that implemented, and so do other vendors that I know of in this space. 
So iOS and Mac, if you have it enrolled, even if it's personal, you do have the ability to completely wipe the device and reset it. On Android, I don't remember if it used to be possible with device admin, but that's a deprecated solution anyways. Today, it's something called work profiles. And the solution doesn't allow you to wipe the personal container of Android. So they can wipe the work profile container but it doesn't have the ability to wipe the phone itself and the personal profile. And with Windows, of course, there is a way to reset it if it's under automated enrollment, but if it's personally enrolled, they don't have the ability to reset the computer. Mm -hmm. So if it's personally owned, personally enrolled, user driven, so to speak, not through autopilot, then there's no way to reset the device. So the behavior is different based on the OS, based on the manner that you're enrolling the device. And so does an MDM solution have the ability to wipe your phone? The answer to it really is it depends, right? You know, and, and I thought you had a good call out there that sometimes the MDM vendors have now started to advance their solutions in ways sometimes kind of being predictive of what the operating system vendors will do. And sometimes just because they believe that's the right thing to do. So I'll give you an example with Intune since I'm familiar with it. Intune, even though Apple's API allowed slash allows you to pull a app inventory for a personally owned device, Intune designed its solution so that if a device is considered personally owned, you cannot pull a device inventory for it. And, you know, that's one of those things where theoretically that that was slash is supported, but they at Microsoft chose that that was just too much invasion of privacy for a device that's not yours. And it's not information you need to have to successfully manage the device and ensure it's healthy. Now, I use some interesting language as I describe that because I kind of use past present tense and everything I said. And here's why. Uh, and I don't remember exactly how long ago this was now, but Apple introduced a few years ago a different method of enrollment for devices that are not under automated device enrollment. And it was called user enrollment. And it was a more restrictive version of enrollment that when it's a personally owned device and I'm like choosing to enroll it in management where it more or less enrolls in the same way, but it even more strongly restricts what your organization can do to your device. So a device that is enrolled under user enrollment cannot be wiped remotely. It's not supported. If they try to kick off a wipe and send that request, it will just remove what the MDM solution put on the phone. It'll kind of roll it back. Um, it will also not respect or enforce password restrictions that are stronger than six digit numeric. So if you're a company and you want to put in like an eight character alphanumeric passcode requirement, you literally can't do that for user enrollment um, scenarios. I don't, and, and I'll be honest, I haven't completely stayed up on, on how this has evolved. I expected Apple to make this the only supported model for devices that are, um, are, uh, not coming in through automated device enrollment. And they have yet to do that is my understanding. I still think that's coming. I still think this kind of legacy enrollment model goes away. And the real line of bifurcation becomes, was this coming through in through automated device enrollment or what, or was this a user driven enrollment? And that'll kind of dictate what you can and can't do, but there's still kind of this third gray area. That's legacy enrollment. That's, that's user driven, um, but not user enrollment. And, uh, I, I get that that's confusing, but that's where today for a lot of people, Andy is hundred percent correct. Your company probably still could wipe your device if they wanted to. And that's where I was getting at with this kind of is, is your organization like malicious? Uh, are they, do they take things too, too far? Um, do they not have a sense of what's theirs versus not theirs? Because like when you remove a device from MDM, in iOS and you just retire it is usually what it's called in a lot of platforms like Intune. What that will do 
automatically is when you remove the device from management, it will remove any managed documents, any managed applications, any managed accounts, basically everything the MDM solution put on, it will rip back off and it will more or less restore the device to the state before it became enrolled. For any company, I would challenge you to say, why is that insufficient? Why is that not enough to meet your needs? And I think very few of them could articulate to the contrary that, you know, they need more. Um, so that's where your company could wipe, but all the companies I've worked for, I haven't worked for a company that r routinely wipes employees devices when they leave the company because they just, they were of the mindset that that's kind of overstepping their bounds. It's not necessary. It's not a requirement. It's not helpful. Um, and it's just not the kind of company we want to be. So I was happy to enroll my devices for them. But if I did work for a company, that's like, we wipe every device when you walk out the door, like then I might've had a different tact, you know? And so I think that's where, even though there are restrictions and they are growing in terms of what companies can do to your personally owned device, ultimately there still has to be some, um, some buy-in from the organization you're working with on how they want to approach that. I like your call out for Intune because I think it's important when you're evaluating different MDM solutions that you should be conscious of what the solution can gather as far as information from the device. When I was implementing Intune at my previous company, one of the best selling points for me internally to present to users at that company was I told them, I can't see what apps you have installed on your device. I can see if you install Office 365 apps that I've deployed via the company portal, that this is a company app that you're going to get it from the company portal and then install it. Yes, I can see that. But any personal apps, dating apps, banking apps, I can't see any of that. And that's a huge benefit to me too as a security professional because I don't want to see that stuff. Mm -hmm. If I had an MDM solution that gathered that information, I would want to know why we're gathering that information. I don't want to see that. I don't want to know outside of the work apps that I'm deploying to you, what you have installed. That's all I want to know. And so that's a good call out because, you know, that's something you should consider when you're evaluating MDM solutions and they say, yeah, we can see all the apps that they're installing. Well, no, I don't want to see that. Right. So as the thread continued, there was some conversation about MAM versus MDM. And I've often kind of gotten into a debate about this too. I think future state, maybe we'll get into just protecting it, but let's just talk about the differences between MAM and MDM and what that constitutes. So, MAM stands for Mobile Application Management, and MDM stands for Mobile Device Management. And different solutions out there will kind of implement different parts of it. But since we kind of know Intune, we'll speak to that. And of course, there are other vendors out there who will implement different solutions like this. But for MAM, the protection happens at the application layer. And so you're protecting the information within the app and that container. So the con the word container also gets marketized like within the, these solutions, right? They're like, oh, we keep all the information within a container. Well, guess what? All the apps that are deployed on mobile devices are containers. They, they are containers. Mm -hmm. And so they're designed to not allow information in and out except within that container. So what MAM does is essentially encrypts and locks that information within the app and then you can also put other controls on top of that. For example, you could require a pin or a biometric to access your Outlook app. And let's say you want to keep your phone with no pin. I don't know if that's even possible these days, but let's say you, you remove a pin from your phone. Well, I could still require you to have a pin for Outlook if you're going to use that for corporate data. I can also prevent you from copying information from Outlook. Now, MAM can be implemented with MDM as well. So you can have both of them together, or you could have just MAM, or you could have just MDM. And the main difference with MDM is you're changing the configuration of that device, as well as 
usually providing some sort of continuous device health attestation and checkups and compliance to make sure that that device stays in compliance. So, you know, MAM is less invasive and certainly nice, but for the most part, I've always leaned towards deploying MDM because there's some other things you can do with MDM, like deploy company apps. You can't do that with MAM, right? MAM is just protecting the apps and it has to have built in hooks into that app already as far as your MDM solution goes or your MAM solution goes. With MDM, you can deploy company apps, you can enforce other configurations like a pin code on the device and, and so on and so forth. So I've always leaned towards MDM um, personally when I deploy it at a company, but to the point of the folks on Twitter, MAM is a much less invasive option and doesn't require you to change configurations on your personal devices. The perfect summary. Not a ton to add there. I, I will say that one of the things that you should consider when you look at mobile application management is what applications does your solution support for that model? I, I think one of the benefits of of using Microsoft for this platform is that you get mobile application management on apps like Outlook, Excel, Word, PowerPoint, Edge, apps that people want to use or need to use. Um, and, and so that's helpful versus like, oh, we're on uh, VMware spreadsheets. You know, we put MAM on that. Like, is that going to mess up my Excel? Is, is that even compatible with my files? Like, that's great. You have MAM, but I don't know if I want to use that. So that's something to consider. The other thing too, is I often articulate like a good, better, best model for access for your users, because even sometimes if you really have one choice you really want them to take. Sometimes the illusion of choice is all it takes to make other options more palatable. So when I articulate good, better, best, mine looks like this. Good. And I, I don't mean good like BlackBerry good. I mean like, you know, it's it's okay. Is you can go to webmail and you can access your email in the webmail interface just through your browser that's built into your phone. You don't need any enrollment. You don't need any ma'am. You don't need any anything. Uh, but we're going to restrict your ability to download attachments through that model. Okay, better. You're going to download, say, the Outlook app from the App Store. We're going to put MAM around it, and that's going to let you get access to your email and move those files to, say, other um, MAM-enabled applications like Word, Excel, PowerPoint. And you can be fairly productive with that, but that's not going to give you access to like corporate Wi-Fi when you're in the office. It's not going to give you access to some of our other line of business applications. It's going to be just like email and productivity apps. And then best is going to be, okay, we're going to enroll your device. You're going to get a profile push. So you automatically connect to corporate Wi-Fi when you're in the office. You're going to be able to use, say, if you really prefer Apple Mail, we're going to let you use it in this model. And then you not only have access to all those MAM apps we've already talked about, but all these other line of business apps that we work with as well. And so you can select the level of comfort that you have and the level of access you need. And I like that model. And sometimes I get pushback from IT folks and saying, well, that's too much to manage. But the fact is there's zero management with offering webmail, because I'm sure you already do. There's practically zero management with offering MAM because there is no like care and feeding of it. If MAM breaks, you delete the app and reinstall it from the app store and you go on with life, the end. Um, so you're really still just doing MDM from a care and feeding perspective. So this sounds like, oh, well, that's too much work. I just want to tell them it's MDM or bust and move on. But you're offering user choice, you're offering self-selection, and you are going to have better, more engaged, happier users who are really pleased with whatever option they chose because it truly was their choice. And I'd be willing to bet Almost everyone is probably going to pick a certain option at your company kind of based on what your company needs. And so most people are going to be in one model anyway. You're, you're going to have some sort of bell curve where the majority of your users are in one option. It, it depends whether that's the MAM or MDM option, just depending on your company's culture, your local geographic culture, and your individual needs. But 
it's nice to have options and it's nice for you as IT to have options. It's nice as your users to have options as well. So we talked about how MDM allows organizations to install apps. And we also talked about those AV apps. Now, one of the questions or concerns that came up in this thread was, what if IT installs a spy app on your phone, pushes out an app that you don't know about? Can we or should we trust them? And I mean, that really gets into a lot of details and discussions that I don't know if we have time to talk about on this show. But I will say, you know, for the most part, like Adam, I've worked for organizations that I generally trust. I'm in IT. I'm the security guy who's deploying it. So I hope I am trustworthy. As well as most security people have the keys to the kingdom. Like if I wanted to be malicious, man, I could take down the company if I really wanted to. You know, I'm the global admin for Azure. I'm domain admin. You know, there's a lot of things I can do. Exchange admin. I can read everybody's email. Do I do it? Absolutely not. Right. I mean, so you're already trusting IT with a lot of things. Do they have time to spy on your personal devices? My my assumption is no, because I've been in internal IT and there's literally no time that I'm going to like investigate Adam's personal email or whatever, even if I had the time to do that. So. I mean, this is all comes down to, you know, how you feel about your employer and. I want to have good faith in my IT folks and trust them. I know that that's maybe naive, but I don't think there are organizations that are maliciously pushing out applications. Although this guy on on Twitter seemed to think that he worked for companies that did that. I mean, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, the answer to this is, yeah, they can install apps. Yes, they could probably push out some sort of spy app. I would really hope that security professionals aren't doing that um then there was a question about the admin app so like for example the company portal app uh, for intune um, airwatch and and those other mdm solutions also have some sort of management app those apps aren't spy apps they're literally just a hook into the mdm solution so uh, no the admin app can't, can't spy on you um yes mdm can push out apps but i mean I hope that security professionals certainly are not pushing out malicious apps. So real quick on this, if you're on an Apple platform, they're not doing this without you knowing about it on iOS. It's impossible because again, iOS apps are sandboxed and containerized and, and one app can't see what other apps are doing unless you explicitly give it any permission to do that. And on iOS, it's still pretty much impossible on Mac OS apps have to ask permission to view the screen apps have to ask permission to read keyboard strokes now. So Mac OS is a really strong kind of privacy configuration that MDM cannot override. So if your company puts an app on your device and it's like, Hey, go give this permission to watch your screen and record your keystrokes. Well, then you know, something's going on and maybe it's time to start putting in some, uh, job applications elsewhere. Uh, Android, you know, I'm not sure what the current story on Android is. I, I assume it's still strong enough to the fact that a company couldn't just install an app that watches everything you do without you having to grant it some pretty explicit permissions. Windows is probably the one where, yes, your company probably could push an app and it could run pretty surreptitiously and monitor a lot of what you're doing. And I've heard of companies doing this, even respectable ones do this. Um, And it tends to be for job roles that are more seen as kind of lower job roles or rank and file or kind of call center type roles. And I've heard some honestly kind of fairly gross justification of this behavior. I, I find it reprehensible. Um, but I would not be surprised if some companies do, I I'd say for the most part, it depends on your platforms as they kind of rattled through them there on Apple. You're just the safest cause it's just not possible without you knowing on some of the other platforms that gets probably easier with, you know, Android moving to windows just by natures of those operating systems. Um, but again, I think to Andy's point, This is where you just kind of know your company's culture and attitude and and how they behave. And you make your best guess on that. But um, I also don't know a lot of companies that are allowing BYOD on Windows 
Microsoft is still a pretty big outlier in that sense. So it's probably not something a lot of our listeners have to worry about. And I think on the other platforms, there's stronger controls. Obviously, on anything your company issues to you that they own, you should absolutely assume they they see everything you do on it. But that's not what we're talking about in this discussion. So another comment was, can't MDM solutions just reset or remove your passcode? And then they would have access to your personal stuff. And the answer to that is yes, MDM solutions can reset or remove passcodes for uh, Android and iOS. Those APIs are published. And if I had physical access to your device, so that's the key, right? If I had physical access to your device and I reset the passcode or remove it, then yes, I could get into your phone, but I have to have physical access to it. And we talked about in the beginning here, you don't just hand your employer physical access to your personal device. So at least not without a warrant or, or some sort of legal justification. So, I mean, that, that's kind of a, again, misconception or really a, a weak argument in the fact that and you shouldn't put this on because they can remove the passcode. Yes. I mean, that's, can be also seen as a benefit like if you forget your passcode and it's under mdm okay well we'll reset it for you right so that was that's my thoughts on that yeah true and then th- this goes back to i mentioned earlier the the user-based enrollment thing as well i believe under user-based enrollment you cannot remove the pin in that scenario on ios in particular but again, I'm a little fuzzy in the details there, so don't quote me. But I think that, again, kind of ties into that Apple model where they're trying to deliver an enrollment model that removes some of these capabilities of MDMs so that even if you do have a malicious company, they can't do some of these things. But the problem is right now that you're not companies aren't forced to use that model. MDMs aren't forced to use that model. So it's like completely optional today. So it's kind of like, all right, Apple, well... I, I like what you're doing here. I see what you're doing, but when are you going to force this to be the default? Cause that's when it will really matter. So for most of our listeners assume they could remove your passcode, but there's going to be an audit log. There's going to be an audit trail for that. And again, like outside of some really, really weird scenario where, you know, that's, that's become possible. You know, I, I don't see that as really a, a major threat. Another question was, can MFA and 2FA apps see your personal data? Because that's a lot of times companies are enforcing MFA and you require an MFA app like Microsoft Authenticator to be installed on a personal device. No management required, just the app itself. Can that have any insight into your apps? Because I, at my previous company, I had users that said, I'm not putting anything on my personal phone. That is a company app. They were an Okta uh, customer and there was the Octa Verify app similar to the Microsoft Authenticator and they said we're not installing it and the answer is no like you you cannot see any personal information with an MFA app so I would recommend installing that on your phone or you know issue a, a different method of MFA if, if that becomes contentious then FIDO2 keys are something you can do right VPN and AV apps. So this is, again, we talked about AV apps and how they can see some data. And then there's also the question of VPN profiles and VPN apps. And for that, when I say personal information, again, they they can't really scan the contents like Adam put out in the Apple managed device that he has in a Mac. Yes, and Microsoft Defender for Endpoint can see the traffic that you're talking to Apple iMessage servers, but it can't decrypt the information within it. So there is some personal information in the fact that your traffic is being seen. And that's the same thing with VPNs. If they deploy a full tunnel or some sort of split tunnel, I mean, maybe even some traffic will be seen as far as personal. They may be able to see that you're using Snapchat servers or Facebook servers or US bank or whatever, you know, bank that you're at so they may be able to see that which is personal information for sure but can they see the contents of your snapchats can they see the contents of your account balance from that app absolutely not 
Yeah. So, so VPN to me is probably one of the more concerning ones. And if a company is making you put a VPN on your device and it appears to be in like not a split tunnel device, which I don't even know if iOS supports like split tunnel as an example, that's concerning to me. Um, so Microsoft Defender for Endpoint uses a loopback VPN, which just means it looks like a VPN is running, but it's using that as a way to run all of your network traffic and your, your destinations through the Defender for Endpoint app and have it inspect those for anything that that is like a known malicious IP or a known malicious botnet or a known malicious host name. So my concern with that is is pretty limited because again that traffic's never leaving your device. It's not traversing a network and your company if you're using defender for endpoint is only getting notified of any host names that you've attempted to access that are malicious. So it's just, that's the only thing that gets reported. It doesn't report back everything you try to do, just the malicious stuff that it flags and catches. So that's probably okay. Um, It still just feels like a little bit of a black box. I'd love a little more visibility and a little more auditability as an end user to just validate that it does what you say it does. Um, But I I do have put a lot of trust in Microsoft A as my employer, but B, um, I think Microsoft has shown a, a real commitment to to user privacy and privacy is a fundamental human right. So I'm comfortable with that. But like if your company is like thou shalt use VPN on your mobile device at all times to Andy's point that even though they can't see like the content, like they couldn't see what you sent a picture of in your Snapchat, they sure as heck could see, well, you seem to be on Snapchat all day, Andy or whatever. And that's that's just a ton of information. Metadata is still a lot of data. There is still a lot of information that can be gleaned from metadata. So VPN really concerns me. Antivirus we already kind of talked about because that actually can and does borderline scan scan content, especially like a data loss prevention solution absolutely scans content. Now, does it report all the content back? No, generally not. But this is where apps that are not MDM become interesting. And generally, I'd say these are more of a, of a risk on those desktop class platforms like Mac OS and windows where the, the ability of agents to monitor and do things is just greater than on mobile platforms where by nature of them being a very stripped down limited operating system, there's, there isn't an opportunity for some sort of agent to sit there and inspect all of your behavior, everything you do. So VPN is kind of the workaround for that. But, um, on, on the grown-up platforms, the, the desktop class platforms, as I call them, that's where I think there's a little more privacy concern here. So, you know, tread lightly. Like, if you have a personally owned desktop class device and you are enrolling it in your company's solution, this is where they could do creepier stuff versus on a mobile platform. Just the limitations of the platform can inhibit your company's worst desires. So there was uh, another comment in the Twitter thread that said that a user had the company, their legal department, sit them down and say, we need to see your personal device because you use it for work. And this actually was from an Apple employee. And the way that Apple works, which is kind of interesting, is that they provide you with a corporate iCloud identity and you can merge your personal iCloud with the company iCloud. And then essentially you sign in with one iCloud, which is your work iCloud onto a phone and you can access company data. And the employee was approached by legal because of some litigation, I assume, and said that they had to provide the contents, which included personal iMessages to the legal department. And, you know, I can't give any legal advice, but for sure I would question anything without some sort of actual document. But in the fact that I think as employees, we're all very vulnerable because this is our employment. And if like Microsoft came to my door and sat me down and said, I'm from the legal department, I need to see your phone. I don't know if I would have the fortitude to push back on that. Cause I mean, if I said no, what's the consequence, right? Like, are they going to fire me? <laughs> I don't know. So I think 
that is where, yes, it's certainly a concern anytime any legal department or litigation or HR is involved and, and you're involved in that and, and they request access. I, I don't know what I would do. So it is certainly a concern. Anytime you access company data, of course, these companies are going to get sued. They're going to get involved in, uh, in litigation. But I think my advice is it really depends on the sensitivity of your job, right? Like I don't have access to a lot of sensitive company data, right? Like most of the stuff that I do at Microsoft is pretty public. Mm -hmm. I explain technology that's public. If I was involved in like a product development research and cutting edge stuff that's not public, then I would be a lot more concerned on the type of data that I'm putting on personal devices. So maybe that's a measure of your risk on what your job duties involve. Like if you're involved in top secret stuff for the government, yeah, don't put that on your phone. Don't put that on your personal device, right? Yeah. I, and I saw some of the tweets you linked here, and I think we should link some of them in the show notes because they're interesting discussion. And and I believe both of them, it sounds like we're employed by Apple and Apple was very, very, very um, demanding over stuff they needed to disclose as part of their employment in general. You know, I don't I don't want to say a whole lot about this because I am not an attorney and neither is Andy, nor that we stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So um, this is where you just need to consult legal counsel as much as possible. If, if something feels wrong, um, push back and, and assert your right to to legal representation before complying with anything. And it, I, I think that's something is good advice in general. But but certainly here, um, if something feels really, really long wrong and invasive it, it possibly is um so you know and and then it, like to andy's point as well depending on the kind of material you work with or the kind of job function you serve your risk appetite should change because exactly i'm in the same boat as andy i don't have access to anything that's really like substantially damaging to microsoft as a company so there would be less likelihood they'd really want to like thoroughly go through anything I have because what are they looking for? There's there's nothing they they would really want or would be worth an investigation of that caliber. But it sounds like for people who might have different roles and responsibilities, you might want to eliminate any possibility of entanglement and say, like, just give me a corporate device. I'm never enrolling anything personal with you. Um, issue me a device or Andy's model, at least of having kind of a, a work phone that he personally purchased. But and, and and I guess I'd be curious to hear this, Andy. Do you still put like your your iCloud account on there and everything? Or do you really limit like what personal stuff is on there? So if you were ever asked to turn it over, there's just not a lot of material on there. That's a good question. I do put personal stuff on here. I put kind of the, like if I were to only have this phone, mm -hmm. I have access to like just the bare essentials of apps that I need, like my email, my personal email, my personal bank, uh, a couple of apps that I, I would need that if I had just that phone. So, and, and of course I do sync my iMessages through the cloud too. And so that I get, that as well and so it's uh for sure there is some risk there that i am putting if i were to have to turn that phone in there is some personal information that you know if they were able to crack the encryption or force me to give them a pin or whatever it mm -hmm. is um yeah there's personal information on it so yeah i mean that's again what's the answer right like what can what what do we recommend to users and it really that that all depends on your appetite and risk uh, that you want to offload as well as convenience for me having those personal apps on the work device is a convenience thing like i said if i had just that phone i went left with just that phone i have enough that i can function whereas maybe you don't want to put that on there maybe you want to just have it be simply work apps and that's okay too but i think for me, the advice that this guy gives, you know, do not install or let your employer access your personal phone from a management solution. You know, I wanted to have this discussion for our listeners because there are a lot of misconceptions about MDM, right? And 
if, a, if your concern is that the MDM solution, the device management platform, can access your information, we already established that, right? Can't do that. There are other things that can happen, right? Depending on the, depending on the operating system, depending on the apps that are getting deployed, what kind of metadata, as Adam said, the employer can collect. But it comes down to how productive do you want to be? Do you want to work on the device that you want to work on, where you want to work and how you want to work, at what time you want to work, right? So, yeah, I'm going to have devices enrolled in my employer's MDM solution because I want to be productive on my iPad, my iPhone, my Mac device, my personal Windows computer, right? So that's a, a choice that I make because it makes it easier for me. Mm -hmm. But yes, I, I allow my employer some access, if you want to put it that way, into my devices. But it is limited. I, I think to summarize and bring it all together, if you are on a mobile device, an iPhone or an Android device, you should feel comfortable allowing your employer to put management on there. There's... They're just not going to be able to see anything of interest. They're not going to really capture any metadata of interest. And even if they put on some sort of like mobile threat detection platform or anything else, they're still so limited in what they can do. I am very confident that the controls in place by Apple and Google are strong. There's strong separation. There's just lack of functionality in a lot of ways. You're fine on those platforms. I really would not tell you to hesitate. The only thing I would say is if you start to see VPN, and it's not like a local VPN, like a Defender for Endpoint, but it's actually like sending all your traffic somewhere, then maybe reconsider if that's something your company is enforcing. Otherwise, you're probably fine. On desktop class platforms, I think there's more nuance there. If you want to enroll your personally owned Windows device or Mac device, you should probably, for the most part, assume that's pretty much a work device. Not to say you can't do personal things on it too, but... There may be some things you don't want to do on there just because there's the possibility of Big Brother kind of watching. And again, they can't read your messages, can't view your pictures. Even on those devices, really, that's not a thing. But just by nature of them being more robust and allowing more agents to run on them, there is more nuance there. So that's an area if like if you're just risk adverse or you don't understand, you know, how that all fits together, then don't do it. I'd say as technologists, like I am comfortable because I can kind of tell like on my Mac here, what Microsoft can and can't see. So I use my personally owned Mac with Microsoft and it's fine. Um, but if you're, if you're just don't have a solid understanding of, of what to do and what not to do, then, then don't do it. Um, I'd say for desktop class and, and in general, that mostly applies to the Mac because I just know very, very few companies that are mature enough to allow bring your own Windows device. Just I don't see a lot of companies doing that, but kind of the same guidance applies there. So that's kind of ultimately my takeaway. Mobile device is good. MAM is even better and even safer. Um, desktop class devices, that kind of depends a little bit. And all of this depends on what your job role and job function is. The more sensitive information you have access to, the more serious your role, uh, that might inform your decision making. And, and depending on, again, your risk appetite, that might be where you just opt to say, I just want company issued devices for work and I'm, I'll keep my personal stuff personal. It, it's all a choice and certainly respect anybody's opinion on this, but just from a perspective of what is and isn't technically possible, um, hopefully we gave you a good roundup today. Great summary, Adam. Yeah, hopefully we gave you a little bit of clarification on what these solutions can do and gives you some talking points if you have to present to your user base, to your CIO, your CISO on a solution and sell this internally. Because I think for sure device management is here to stay. We're in this type of hybrid, you know, futuristic work model where we're bringing in BYO devices and work devices and just getting to that point where it's a compliant device and it's not necessarily a work or personal device. So that's our show for this week. 
Thanks for listening. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes. If you guys have questions about this episode, definitely bring us bring it up to us. We are very passionate about this topic, as you can tell. So let us know if you have any feedback, any follow-up questions, and we'll answer them for you. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.